Good evening, Steve, and thanks very much for taking the time to speak to The Mint. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Henry. Well, what I'd like to start with um, is Guinness, as this issue, uh, the theme is food. So um, I just wonder um, where the connection to Guinness comes from in your work and, and what comes from that. <laughs> you mean from the food perspective or for... <laughs> no, just the, uh, in terms of how is statistics connected with Guinness? Ah, yes, indeed. Oh, my. Um, <clears throat> there's a t technique in statistics uh, which, which every uh, um, university student must learn in economics, business, medicine, psychology, all the social sciences and life sciences use a particular technique in statistics called the test of statistical significance. Right. And, and, right? and, uh, and uh, when we're introduced to this idea, we're, uh, we're oftentimes told that significance means something like important or discovery or you found something. And then insignificance, we're oftentimes told, means not important, did not make a discovery, you did not find anything worth uh, looking into any further from the scientific or business point of view, okay? Yeah. So the students are taught early on to put a lot of rhetorical weight on this word significant or insignificant, it's, it's opposite. Well, it turns out that the tech side behind this this um, technique called the test of statistical significance is actually called students t-test or students test of statistical significance now when I was in college um, most people including me had no idea what that really meant in fact I tell my students at Roosevelt University that uh, I thought that students' test of significance was for students, and there must be some alternative test that the faculty use called <laughs> <Right. faculty. laughs> Anyway, it turns out that I, um, I was working on a, uh, my book with uh, Deirdre McCluskey called The Cult of Statistical Significance. It's a, a history, philosophy, uh, uh, sociology, and quantitative uh, economic study of the very use of statistical significance in economics, uh, medicine, and agriculture. No laughing matter, it turns out. The subtitle of our book is how the test causes us a loss of jobs, justice, and lives. So I'm a historian, an economic historian by PhD training. So I went to the archives to try to figure out what was behind the student's test of significance. It turns out that student is the pen name of a man whose real name is William Seeley Gossett. William Gossett was a day, by, by day job, he was head experimental brewer of Guinness beer. Right. And, yeah, and what, what Mr. Gossett was doing with his test was something very, very different, Henry, than what's going on under his assumed pen name, student right now. People are abusing his test, Henry. Eight or nine or 10 of every published articles in the top journals of science misuse students' tests of significance. But he never did, not at the Guinness Brewery. I think you can guess why. You wouldn't want to get it wrong and ruin the Guinness. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you don't want them to confuse it for a lesser beer, that's for sure. <laughs> So, so how how is this? Uh, how does abusing this statistical test lead to um, you know this amazing impact, loss of jobs, uh, uh, and so on? Well, <clears throat> it turns out that um, since the 1920s, uh, and a, a very influential book by a person that I call Gossett's frenemy. You know, like in Facebook talk, you have a frenemy. That's a portmanteau of friend and enemy at the same time. Right. <laughs> okay. So uh, Gossett and Fisher is his name, Ronald A. Fisher, highly influential, ingenious uh, mathematical geneticist um, and a mathematical statistician. 
he published a textbook of statistics in English, the very first one in English, called Statistical Methods for Research Workers. And he, he himself began the misinterpretation and misuse of students' original intentions and indeed his actions at the Guinness Brewery. A uh, student took what's called an economic approach to the logic of uncertainty. And by that, I mean he focused on what McCluskey and I call the oomph versus the precision of his estimates. Now, when you're trying to do quality control um, at high economies of scale, we're talking about 100 million gallons of Guinness beer sold per year, 100 million gallons of Guinness stout sold wow. per year, unpasteurized also, by the way. Um, so you really had to know how your beer um, kept its condition, how it maintained its good life and, and avoided bad bacteria and all those wonderful things that brewers and chemists know about and care about. So Gossett had to build into his test of statistics what, he, what we now call the loss function. So for example, in the very first use of students' t-test before it was known by that name, in 1904, Gossett was studying what we call wort. Um, that's the stage of the beer process before adding yeast to, um, to ferment the beer into an alcoholic beverage. And it's by studying the wort, you can find out what the ultimate ABV or alcohol uh, by volume percentage is going to be. So Gossett used a technique that's well known um, among uh, chemists and brewers to do that with it, with his saccharometer. And the industrial standard for, for Guinness at that time to keep the percentage at whatever it was, let's say 4.2% ABV for the for Guinness draft, for example, the amount of sugar or saccharin was 133 degrees. And they knew that. They knew that from repeated studies in the uh, chemical lab and all of that stuff. So when Gossett went and looked at samples of different batches of Guinness uh, beer, he decided he needed to have an error bound that was defined not, not by statistics, but by, by beer quality control and, and by economics. Because if the alcohol, if the ABV content, the sugar content goes up too high, the British government was going to tax Guinness at a progressively higher rate on the higher um, alcohol beer. Imagine, you know, the difference between, let's say, a tax on Bud Light versus a tax on a strong Belgian triple or something like that. Okay. So that we're talking about a nonlinear, highly progressive tax rate per unit. Per, um, so that's um, why you had to get it right. <laughs> he had to get, exactly. So he had a strict economic incentive to get it right. Plus, if, if there's too much variation on the upper end, there's going to be a different kind of riot in Dublin and London that night. <laughs> <laughs> but likewise, going down, right? If the variation goes too far below 133, now you're going to have a different problem and a different type of disappointment among your customer base. So he decided that one half degree sugar content was um, was a variation that, that uh, so to speak, the Guinness uh, company and, and its consumer could swallow. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yes. so then he asked the statisticians question, which is how many batches of this wort do I need to mix in order to get odds of, let's say 10 to one or better that my actual sugar content falls with that within that 133 plus or minus one half. How do you get to that range of oomph of customer satisfaction and with probability of say 10 to one or higher? And uh, that's where he uses real creativity. And he said, gosh, you know, um, small sample, the idea of using a small number of samples, like say a sample size of four hops or four different types of barley, that's actually an economic decision, isn't it, Henry? Because it's very expensive to, to uh, experiment on new varieties of the inputs to the beer, especially uh, to get some sort of assurance that it's going to work for, for the Guinness company on that large scale of production. And so Gossett asked, you know, could I get accuracy at two samples? How about three samples? How about four samples? And it turns out that it, 
four samples of his wart, he he felt like he had he could uh, predict that with ten to one or better odds, his um, his uh, alcohol content was going to be within that range of oomph within that loss function, and so that that's just a beautiful illustration of how to combine science, business, um, economics, thinking about gains and losses all together, you know, but unfortunately that type of training has been lost in our econometrics courses, both undergraduate and graduate. Okay. So, so how, what's the main uh, crime that people do now then, or that you've identified in a lot of cases? Yes. So, uh, as, um, my longtime co-author Deirdre McCluskey, and I've been showing uh, since the mid '90s in um, in a number of papers and in a full length book. Uh, the main crime is that economists and and uh, other decision makers across the, the sciences and, and policy, and including the law, they confuse a finding of statistical significance with a finding of economic significance. So to go back to the Guinness example. It would be as if all all Gossett cared about is if he could find um, odds of ten to one or better. Um, period, but and without looking at what's the actual result on the underlying product, which is the beer he's trying to perfect and keep uh, constant from the uh, branding and quality control point of view. So that. To imagine saying you have a high probability of seeing something in the Guinness beer, but the thing you're neglecting is the Guinness beer. You're f you're forgetting about the quality control and a child. Well, the point is, you're possible. forgetting the point. Exactly. And that's what people are doing often. Can you give me an illustration where a significance test is being used with, and, and the point is being totally ignored? Yes, well, <clears throat> there's a famous case now um, in the United States that, uh, with some tragedies involved. Um, there was a very effective pain relief pill called Vioxx, V-I-O-X-X, -X, in the United States. In Europe, it was widely known as Cox, uh, spelled with a C. And this pain relief pill was quite effective uh, uh, for people and that's one of the reasons that the company that marketed it made so much money in sales people liked it and in fact my own son uh, who gets some um, repetitive motion um, uh, problems from time to time in his joints he was briefly prescribed the same vi Vioxx pill uh, well um, in 2003 2004 um, there were some um, sudden deaths of fatal heart attacks among people who seem like surprised cases. Um, and it turned out that what they had in common is that they were taking Vioxx. Right. Um, yeah, and so you remember this? And so there yeah, was an yeah, investigation. There was an investigation done and it turns out that the, the clinical trial was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, a highly rated medicine journal. Um, which holds as a bright line standard of statistical significance p less than 0.05 that magic so-called magic number that is not magic at all in fact it's it's a dangerous bright line as as uh, i've been showing and Deirdre and i've been showing together for all these years but um yeah so uh the journals has this arbitrary rule that as so many other journals do that says if the p value uh, which is one of the ways that we express the level of statistical significance if it's less if it's not less than 0 0.05 then basically the journal's opinion is that you don't have anything of medical or human or economic importance okay. um, and, and and moreover, they don't even want to publish the findings that the so-called uh, you know estimates that don't reach this level of statistical significance measured by the p-value. So there's a censoring function going on as well as a um, uh, a uh, a point about how much page uh, uh, attention is going to be associated 
to, um, to the estimate, significant or not significant. The point here is that in the clinical trial, there, were, uh, there was sufficient evidence uh, to the tune of eight to one adverse events in the Vioxx uh, treatment group versus the naproxen um, control group. It was eight to one. But it turns out that the, the company made another error, which, is, which was to hide three of the adverse events from the Vioxx crowd so that what they reported in the um, published paper was a five to one adverse event ratio, which did not reach the level of statistical significance um, adhered to by the journal. And therefore they were able to continue marketing this uh, highly um, effective, but very dangerous uh, to um, very dangerous uh, pill. So it wasn't um, just a misuse of statistics. It was, also a, a hiding of, uh, of evidence as well. But even a, if, so why, sure. so five to one, um, that turned out not to be significant. If they'd approached it, how would they have approached it so that they would have seen the significance, if you see what I mean? What, how did they get it wrong? Well, uh, Chan if, if the pills are equal, chance tells you that there's not going to be any difference in adverse events, right? Assuming that you've controlled for all the selection error and the um, systematic errors across the different people in your experimental units. If that work hasn't been done, and a lot of times it's not, as I've shown in my studies of randomized control trials, if you haven't controlled for all those other kind of errors, you're just going to have a nothing but piles of errors you're looking at anyway. But suppose you've fixed uh, most of those other problems. Well, then chance tells you that the adverse events are gonna be similarly distributed across uh, the treatment and control group, uh, you know, uh, naproxen versus Vioxx. But here, even five to one, if it were me, um, I'm thinking like Adam Smith and the theory of moral sentiments or I'm thinking about what if it's my mom or my dad or my, or whoever, you know, uh, somebody I, I love um, involved here, that five to one is enough for me to start paying attention. And five to one, so for every six people, one of them was, had an adverse effect. Uh, no, no, sorry. I'm, um, I'm using it in a different way. What I'm saying is that there were five, uh, there were in, in reality, there were eight adverse events in the um, Vioxx treatment group and only one um, adverse event in the naproxen. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yeah. yes. So, you were eight times as likely <laughs> right. to get a serious effect, basically, and that should have been significant in itself. Is this what you're saying? If put it this way, if we were at the horse track, um, we, we would know where to put our money. Yeah. <laughs> and somehow because of the statistical test that even say it was five times as likely to get a, 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 a negative impact, it was not picked up because it was sort of ignored that that five meant it would be a, a hell of a lot of people involved. Exactly. It's, it's as if, um, nothing, there was no difference at all. So it's a, it's a terrible, it's a logical error, it's an ethical error, and it's a statistical error. It's, it's just wrong. And okay, so if we can change tack here, because I know you've got a very diverse portfolio of interest, but I just wondered how coming from there, you link, or, or is there a link to your interest in haiku poetry? How do, <laughs> how do those two things come together? <laughs> oh, that's a very good question. Um, before I got involved in um, uh, advanced economics, uh, I, I had a, an undergraduate degree in economics, uh, but excuse me, I was um, running around more with artists and poets uh, uh, throughout college and then afterwards. And I had the good fortune when I was living in Indianapolis of meeting a poet named Etheridge Knight, who turns out to be one of America's greatest poets and highly celebrated. He won the American Book Award 
1987 for his collected poetry called The Essential Etheridge Knight. Etheridge Knight is a fascinating uh, person, um, African-American, born to a um, tenant farming family of, of size 12 um, in uh, Mississippi. Um, he's essentially self-educated, and um, there's more to say about him, but long story short, I was attending uh, one of Etheridge's uh, very loosely organized in his style uh, poetry workshops called the Free People's Poetry Workshop. And one day Etheridge said to me, Steve, you should combine haiku and economics. I mean, you're already an <laughs> economist and well, you should put haiku and econ together. And I said, yeah, that's a really cool idea, Etheridge. And then I walked away and for 10 years, it was just a dream. I didn't, I didn't really know I hadn't invested myself in haiku poetry, and I, I, I thought it sounded cool, and I was honored that he would say something like that to me, but I didn't know what to do. And then um, in 2001, I was teaching at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, and I had a lot of students. I had like 220, 225 students, science and engineering majors primarily, in an auditorium, and I, I was trying to find ways of connecting with them. And I, I went into uh, my local watering hole, um, <laughs> my local pub, and, uh, and um, one evening, and my friends were at the uh, bar, and they were all busy scribbling away. I said, well, what are you guys doing? And he said, we're writing haiku poetry. Right. Haiku poetry. I said, oh, I know about that. And I, I said, well, I'm going to write some about economics. And, and Henry, I sat down and I wrote 22 haiku about economics, economic theory and other parts of the economy that night, 22. Wow. And um, yeah, and I was so, so excited uh, the next day to return to Georgia Tech and, and to tell the students about that. It was, it was so much fun. And, and it, you, yeah, so you, uh, a little, say it again. Can you give me an example of one of your haiku poems, okay. poems yes, on economics? <clears throat> Invisible hand, mother of inflated hope, mistress of despair. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, because of course, those who fail by the market are in despair, I guess. Is that? Yes, that's right. Well, you know, um, as Adam Smith says again and again in um, the theory of moral sentiments, fortune is um, a combination of skill and luck. So you, you know, um, and the invisible hand is certainly in, in his larger theory, connecting the TMS with the wealth of nations. That, that's, uh, you know, those two things are always going hand in hand. And um, I like the way that, um, despair um, works with inflated hope. And I also uh, like the way that um, the hand uh, metaphor is working in that poem. Yeah. And, and how, what do you think doing haiku poetry or bringing that sort of way of thinking adds to your practice as an economist and what other people, how other people do economics? Good question, Henry. I um, I was surprised um, by something that happened to me um, in like 2008, 2009. Um, <clears throat> Jack Reardon, whom you probably know, Jack Reardon, the editor. Yes. Of the, yeah, you know Jack from ICAPE and International Journal of uh, Pluralism and Economics Education. Um, Jack is really into haiku economics um, and asked me would I please write down um, basically what's, what's the theory, what's the practice, um, what can we do with this? And it really, it really threw me into what the haiku poets call my haiku journey. And I, I see it now as a lifestyle, as as well as a, a, a mode of representation. Um, and I, I learned it by studying the great um, haiku poets from uh, 17th century, 18th, 19th century Japan, including especially Matsuo Basho, um, who's considered the, um, the Shakespeare of Japan. He's the, 
the inventor of, of modern haiku. Uh, and <clears throat> basically what I, what I found is that if you think in terms of, uh, of um, what we call a Venn diagram or two overlapping circles, one of the circles contains the ideas, theories, facts, ways of thinking about stuff in economics. And then the other circle, again, only partially overlapping that other one, is haiku poetry. If you put those two things together, in the overlaps, you have something promising. Both haiku poets and economists focus on counting, efficiency, budget constraints, representative examples, life cycles over time, um, and especially loss. Um, so the budget constraint for the haiku poet is conventionally arranged in 17 sounds. In the English language, it's, it's 17 sounds arranged in three lines of, of uh, prose, fi um, of imagery, I should say, not prose. There's too much prose in a lot of haiku. But it goes like this, five, seven, and five for a total of 17 sounds. So the first line of your poem, like Invisible Hand, can only have five sounds. The second line has seven sounds, um, a mother of inflated hope. Um, and then um, the second one, I mean, the third line uh, has five more sounds, mistress of despair. Um, and so, so, okay, so those are the overlaps, I said. But what do they add to each other? And here's where I think um, economists can learn uh, the most from the poets. John Stuart Mill says in his autobiography that he had a nervous breakdown at age 19 for a reason that I think is still relevant. He couldn't decide if he was a utilitarian and should follow, therefore, the maximization strategies of Jeremy Bentham and so forth, or was John Stuart Mill a socialist and was he going to go down that path? Um, he had a nervous breakdown. It took him a year or so to recover. And he says in the autobiography that the thing that healed him, what brought him back to um, a, a sense of balance and understanding in his life was reading poetry. Primarily, he was reading Horace and Virgil, um, but also um, some uh, more contemporary poets like Wordsworth. And uh, what, what Mill says there is quite interesting and relevant for this connection between haiku and economics. He says that, that um, utilitarian teaching and theory had essentially crowded out our imagination. It crowded out our ability to feel the economy. And he said that's why he had that nervous breakdown. He couldn't feel anything anymore. And what brought him back to his feelings and, and then finally to emotional balance and functioning in the world was reading poetry. And the more I looked into the haiku poets, the more I saw the same sentiment. So I, you know, uh, let me circle back to one more point, Henry. Um, Adam Smith says, before we can ever judge something from the point of view of gratitude or resentment, reward or punishment, this is the same Adam Smith from The Wealth of Nations. He says in The Theory of Moral Sentiments that we have to consider the intention of people's hearts, secondly, their external actions, and thirdly, fortune, what, what was the final result. But that intention of the heart thing doesn't come for free, does it? Anybody who's raised children or, or had dependents in the household um, knows that intention of the heart is something that you educate that's some you know we we spend a lot of time as parents and and others in society trying to help people educate their hearts um and uh so that's what i think i can i can bring by combining poetry and economics so would you would you say that people who are able to get lost in tests of significance without seeing the point or in some sense sort of unbalanced uh, and have lost that feeling and uh, that sense of the wider world, if you like. Yes, I, I definitely do. And I, I've written about that some in um, a paper with, uh, with my um, student, Edward Teeler Posadas. It's called The Unprincipled Randomization Principle in, in Economics and Medicine. And that's exactly the point that we make, that, that there's, 
there's an ethical loss here um, in the mechanical use of statistical significance where we can't even see or feel um, the real substantive significance of our decision making. The poor deceased or the, the survivors of the deceased from, from the Vioxx pill and countless uh, other cases. Um, I first learned about this when I was working for the Department of Employment and Training in Indiana, and I was uh, asked by a citizen to help him find unemployment rates for black youth workers in Indiana labor markets. I couldn't find the data. My boss couldn't find the data. His boss couldn't find the data. Finally, we ended up on the telephone with the U.S. Department of Labor in Chicago, who oversaw us, and uh, they said, oh yeah, we, we do collect black youth unemployment rates in Indiana labor markets, we just don't publish them. And I said, well, why don't you publish them? And they said, well, the p-values are too high, they're greater than 0.10, and that's the U.S. Department of Labor's shut-up point. <laughs> right. You're right, but I asked myself, now look, so therefore the public policy decision is not to discuss black unemployment because the numbers are not statistically significant. Something's going wrong here. <laughs> Indeed. Well, that, that I think is a very good point to end it. And uh, thank you very much, Steve, for giving your time. And obviously we need to make sure all economic students do poetry. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you so much. And please keep up your excellent work uh, advocating for pluralism and, and uh, making that happen in the real world and the business sector and elsewhere. Uh, we need you now more than ever, Henry.